A speaker and this person is going to actually preach um, usually I would interview people I would always ask them draw out from them who they are and how they actually are in the real world but this time I want my amazing beautiful brother to actually tell us um, something that a lot of us you know forget that is our supernatural identity in jesus i'm not so sure how he's going to go and pack whatever it is that he's going to unpack but one thing i love about this man of god is that he is deep and fun <laughs> so without further ado this man of god has uh through so many books there are about six five six books and i'm going to go and show it to you a little later none other than my brother joseph sturgeon hi hi there i know i don't have the drum roll and the clapping yet i don't know how it works <laughs> <laughs> that's funny thank you so much for being here i know you're going to be talking about uh you know how you discovered yourself maybe in the lord i don't know as long as you're going to go and talk about the supernatural identity that so that just to encourage other people at the same time remind those people that actually they forget sometimes right mm -hmm. when we are so flooded with so much of the things that's happening around us right brother so yes you know what i'm I, i'm gonna get out of here very quickly so you, you're just gonna go and have the have the stage my dear brother thank you so much <laughs> guys i'll be showing some stuff while he is talking like this 
like that. That's the books that he has. These are the books that he has. And I'm going to show you this. If you ever get, like, you will be blessed by him. And here is how we're going to bless him monetarily. Okay, I'll see you guys later. And take it, take it, take it, take it. I'm not so sure how this works. <laughs> <laughs> how in the world is it going to be just you, Lord Jesus? Let oh. There we go. Awesome. So um, I was under the impression that uh, I was just going to speak. And so I prepared to speak and all of that kind of stuff. So um, Ruth, if after I get done and I won't, you know, I'll have to talk long. Um, I talk for a living. I hear myself talk every day. <laughs> so I don't need to hear myself talk. Um, but if, if at the end you want to get on and do questions like you normally did, I, I didn't realize that that is how you had planned it. Uh, but that's great. I'm good. With whatever. I'll, I know where you are, <laughs> but take it away. I mean, you know, I feel like this is how it should be this okay. time. So, you know, just in case we'll see. Okay. Right. Enjoy right. guys. <clears throat> it's, it's fun how she can just like pop back on. It's like, it's like, where's Ruth? Like, Oh, there she is. She's back on the screen. Um, I am so excited to be here with all of you guys. Um, uh, in this in this setting um i'm so thankful for ruth and the work that she is is doing around the world with all of you guys and how she is taking the talents that god's given her and the connections that god's given her and, and using it to um, reach people all over the world um, in this format um, and so i absolutely um, love it i'm honored to be here and just thanks for being a big sister and everything else that you are um, as we all continue to grow, uh, get to know each other and grow in um, relationships. So um, today I wanted to talk about, um, and it's kind of the thing that, that she had mentioned before, I wanted to talk about um, identity. And, um, you know, we can weave, um, so I think tomorrow uh, maybe we'll get in, I just kind of want to give you guys a biblical foundation that you may not have had before or may not have heard before um, that's a little bit deeper. Um, and then, you know, we can get into fun. I can tell fun stories all day. Um, and I'm very happy to uh, do that. Um, so the, the, the journey of identity is, is something that is radically important for um, everybody um, who calls Jesus Christ Lord. And um, something that, that I've noticed is that there is an amazing revelation of sonship that's going around the world and how we're, we're sons. And, you know, and some people say we're all sons and some people say we're sons and daughters and they can say whatever they want to say. Um, you're, you're a son or a daughter and Jesus loves you just like you are. So if you're a son, be a son. If you're a daughter, be a daughter. Um, but one of the things that I've discovered in, in, in going a little bit deeper is that there's more than just sonship. Who you are, um, both as a son of God, as, as a spirit being, as somebody who, um, you know, has been born from above, um, is what the Bible says. It says the, the language actually says born from above. If you've been born from above, um, you are absolutely positively a son. And the revelation of sonship that all of these amazing people around the world are um, releasing into the world and, and accompanying with signs, wonders and miracles and all that kind of stuff is, is fantastic. Um, but what I wanted to say is that that's not the end. The signs, wonders, and miracles that you're seeing is not the end. I, I remember, you know, first getting uh, first getting baptized in the Spirit and and you know beginning to speak in tongues and doing that kind of thing. And you know when I when I first came into it, if you did that, that was like the pinnacle. That that was that was it. You got in, you spoke, and you did your she came in a Honda and all of you know all the praying in the Spirit, and you did that, and it was like you got it. You're it. You you just ready to go, and and it and it became idolized um, to uh, you know to a certain extent um, to where um, hey guys from Ghana I just see all the comments that's amazing um, it, it became idolized to 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 a certain extent that that you got you know you got saved you got filled in the spirit hopefully at the same time and uh, but if not it's fine and and then you spoke in tongues and then after you spoke in tongues it's like that's the pinnacle of what it meant to be um, to be a Christian and then you have all these amazing people who who um, Ruth is connected to, um, and they come in and just power, 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 heal the sick, raise the dead, do all that kind of stuff. And I've, I've done that stuff. I've raised, I've raised two people. You know, I'm not, I'm not like some of the other people who get upset if they don't raise a, you know, raise a person from the dead every week, but I have raised few people from the dead. Uh, but, 
you know, but and, and there's this this power that goes along with sonship, and there's this manifestation that come goes along with sonship, and it's it's beautiful, and it's something that the whole world um, needs to know. Um, I believe it's an integral part of the gospel, and um, what I wanted to to say to that is that don't allow the revelation of and as amazing it is and as powerful it is, don't allow that. Don't allow your mind to allow you to think in the way that that is the pinnacle of what it means to be born from above. Don't allow your mind to go to the place that, that, that that's where we need to go in order to get done what it is that God has us do in the earth. I'm here to tell you that that's the starting place. And, 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 and what's beautiful about that is that every single time, Hey guys from Spain. Hello, Philippines. Hey everybody. Um, <clears throat> is that every time God does something new in the earth, Every time God releases something new in the earth, um, that and, and it's amazing, and it's and we're all we're all going after it. You know, it's like we're we're, we're doing spiritual calisthenics, and 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 we're going after it, and we're working, and and we're we're moving, and we're believing in faith, and doing all that kind of stuff. Don't allow yourself to think that that is just, um, you know, that that is the pinnacle of what it means. Don't allow yourself to think that that the best God can do is signs, wonders, and miracles. Don't allow yourself to think that the best that God can do is raise somebody from the dead. It's amazing. It's awesome. But don't allow yourself to put that limitation. And so many people do it and they don't even realize it. If you think that raising the dead is a pinnacle of what, of what it means to be a son of God, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to believe in Jesus Christ, then you've just put a ceiling over yourself. Don't allow yourself to do that. And so what I want to dig into to today is just a little bit more of, of what it means to be a Christian, to, to, to believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life. And I'm going to take some Bible examples. And, you know, you can't, can't have this conversation everywhere because you have this conversation in some places. And when you have this conversation, people think it's because of something that they did. So right, up, right, right from the start. I'm going to tell you I'll tell you something. And when when God started sharing with this with me, and you know, it was during a time in my life where uh, Jesus was appearing to you know He appeared face to face to me every day for three years while I was in um, Bible college, and I, you know, all the time now. But <clears throat> He was started sharing this to me, and I got really offended um, because and the offense in me said, "I can't say that about myself. I can only say that about you." And <clears throat> and so. Um, we'll get into it, but you, but you can't have this conversation everywhere you go because people get offended and what they're offended with is how powerful they are. It's when, when you truly begin to discover who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you, it will offend you to no end because you'll, you, and what will go through your mind and what will go through your heart is I, is I'm not that powerful, but Jesus is. And, 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 and so there's that end of it, that end of the spectrum. And then there's the other end of the spectrum where you really do begin to figure out who you are and you think it's because of something that you did. <laughs> you think it's, and, and, and look, I know we're all God's favorite. You know, I'm, I'm sure Ruth is the most favorite favorite, but I'm second most favorite favorite. Kidding, not kidding. Um, but you can get off into, you think you're special and you're really not. You are. You're God's favorite, but you need to understand that everything that I'm about to tell you is because of what Jesus did on the cross. That has nothing to do with you or anything that you did. It is a spiritual reality, but it has nothing to do with what you did. It's part of the finished work of the cross. It's, it's part of Jesus saying it's finished and, and, you know, and this death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And so what it begins with um, is a very simple concept. And, and um, I'll say it like a buddy of mine, um, Chris Blackaby. Um, says it. Um, there are not two spirits in your body. There's only one spirit. And that one spirit that exists in your body looks like this. Your spirit and Christ's spirit have become one spirit. Right? You and Jesus have, be have become one. Your spirit and Christ's spirit has, have, become, um, have become one spirit. You, you are one with him. And so when God the Father looks at you, what he sees is Jesus Christ. He sees he's it's it's your expression of Jesus Christ, but he looks and he sees Jesus Christ. So there's not two spirits in your body. There's only one spirit. And if you want to go a little bit deeper, the seat of that spirit is actually in the back of your head, not your chest, but in the back of your head. 
and it's a flame, um, and it's called the Yechida flame. It's a Hebrew word, and, and, and they see it as the flame, of, you know, uh, in that perspective, they see it as the flame of the intellect. But what that flame is, is it is the, it is the union of your flame with God's flame, and you have become one flame. And by the way, that's the light that shines. This is the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm, that song, right? That's that flame. It exists in the back of your head. Um, it's, you know, um, it is also seen as a candle flame, but, but that is, that is the place in the seat of your spirit and the place where, where you have union with Jesus Christ it is, it is a place through which you access the father. It's a seat of your spirit. So, um, so that place, um, has massive implications. And so basically one of the, you know, so there's the Bible verse that talks about verse, verses that talk about how, you know, we have, we begin everything that pertains to life and godliness. We've been, you know, and um, as he is, so are we, right? And so you see things like that. But one statement that you can make, as it has to do with that, and I want to show you, I'm going to take you all through the book of John and show you how Jesus did it. Um, but one of the thing, one of the statements that you can make about identity because of that union that you have with Christ is that if Jesus is, so am I. So what? So let's make that really practical. If Jesus is wisdom, I am wisdom. If Jesus is love, I am love. If Jesus is joy, I am joy. If Jesus, here's the one that uh, that offended me when I said it. If Jesus is the desire of nations, I am the desire of nations. Now, once again, that has nothing to do with you. It has to do with Christ. And Christ in you. When God the Father looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. Everybody gets afraid of demons. And I've encountered plenty of them and shapeshifters and all the stuff, right? Do you know what they see when they look at you? Eyes made out of fire. Long white hair. Feet burnished with bronze. And a sword coming out of your mouth. They see ascended Jesus when they look at you. Because your spirit and Christ's spirit have become one spirit. You're one with him. And so it becomes a massive, powerful tool is you don't need wisdom. You don't need more wisdom in any situation. You are, you are the embodiment of wisdom because Christ is the embodiment of wisdom. Now there is maturity that needs to happen and learning to access that wisdom. But the first thing you need to understand is that you are wisdom. You've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Okay. So part of that is wisdom. You need wisdom. You are wisdom. You are the desire of nations. People are desiring you. Now, the you that they're desiring is the you that's one with Jesus, right? And so you can you can go into this concept further and further. But one of the things that it boils back down to is <clears throat> something that God said, um, God the Father, Yahweh, said um, a very long time ago. When he revealed himself is, I am that I am. And there's a concept in here that I want to dig into that is very, very important as it has to do with your maturity in identity and the, in, in the realization of who you are. So there are, there are many ways that that can be translated, but there are three that I want to, um, that I want to hone in on to kind of focus on. The first one is I am that I am. The second one is um, I will be what I will be. The third one, which is the one I really want to focus on, is I am already everything that I will be. So when God says, uh, and so the Hebrew word is ehiye esha ehiye. Okay? I, but, I butcher Hebrew words. I don't have my in, but I, I'm working on it. Um, so, but those, those three words, ehiye, asha, ehiye. I am that I am. The one I want to focus on is one of the things that God is saying about himself is I am already everything that I will become. Outside of time, outside of space, outside of all of that kind of stuff, everything that God ever is, is going to be, he already is. Jesus took that and in his ministry on the earth, exp expanded upon it masterfully. Um, one of the things that, that Jesus, and so, it, you look at now, let's switch to Jesus of Nazareth, walking on the earth. And he's walking on the earth. And what he wants, you know, one of the things that he's doing, he's doing a lot of things. 
And there's lots of messages from lots of people about all things Jesus did. But one of the things that Jesus is doing is revealing more of, him, of himself. And in revealing more of himself, he's revealing more of the Father. Okay? So <clears throat> what Jesus realizes is that, um, is that in order for, in, in, in every situation that I'm about to show you, either right after or right before, Jesus makes an identity statement. And, and I, I adore identity statements. Um, I, I don't know if you guys remember. Uh, it's back, if you're around my age or a little bit older, um, it's back when we were cool. We're not cool anymore, but it's back when we were cool. Those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Um, and my mom used to say, what would JoJo do? Right? And so, um, you know, we had those little bracelets and it was always, you know, it was always, um, about that. But you look at Jesus and what he is doing is he's making an identity statement. And so I, I love, no, when I wake up in the morning, I fill my morning with identity statements. I am wisdom. I am understanding. I am healing. I am resurrection. And I fill my day with those because I know that because Jesus is those things, I am those things, not because of anything I did, but because of the finished work of the cross. And so one of the things that happens, I'll give you something just a little bit deeper. One of the things that happens when you begin making those identity statements, I'm going to show you, I'm, Jesus is about to show you how to frame one. <clears throat> when you begin making those identity statements about yourself, one of the things that happens is it begins to frame the atmosphere and the angelic structure that's around you, the angelic host that's been sent to co-labor with you and help you. It begins to frame the atmosphere around you in such a way that you, you wake up in the morning and you say, I am a king. And you make that declaration that I'm a king. When you begin to make those declarations and when you begin to believe that about yourself, not because of you, but because of Jesus, you begin to frame the atmosphere around you to where it begins to set a demand. And so you wake up every morning, I'm a king. So there's several demands that are being set. When you wake up in the morning, you say, I'm a king. The first demand is the angelic host around you now has instruction about the revelation and the dimensions and the dimensions of revelation to begin to open up and bring towards you. You make a, an identity statement of every morning of I am love. Then what's going to happen is the angelic host around you is going to start shifting things, is going to start co-laboring with you to shift things around you to bring revelation of love and what it means to become the embodiment of love to you. Now, it's it's interesting because, you know, we, we've I've heard this in charismatic and Pentecostal church my whole life. It's like uh, the Mark eleven twenty two 22 passage, and it says, uh, something along the lines of have faith in God and, and you know, that they get their They begin. I'm not a preacher. I'm a teacher, but they begin to get their preach on. And there's like, it doesn't say have faith in God. It says have the faith of God. And they end the sentence and ha, and you know, things like that. Right. And so have the faith of God. And so from that, it's, you don't need love. You, you need to become the embodiment of love. Becoming the embodiment of love is all about coming into the realization that you all are, are already love because that's who Jesus is. And the more you realize how much he loved you first, the more you're going to become the, the embodied manifestation of the love that he already is. And then you get to be walking around the earth being a love bubble and a joy bubble and everybody you come in contact with gets that. But once again, this is about identity. The central issue about this is, is identity. And so <clears throat> um, let's... Um, Let's, let's just go through a few passages and watch what Jesus does. Um, so I've got another screen up here, so I'm going to um, read um, <clears throat> John chapter 6. Um, and, well, actually, you know what? I'm just going to give you a general review of part of John chapter 6. So John chapter 6 is about Jesus feeding the 5,000, right? And so there are 5,000 men, but he's got women and children there. Um, and so there is way more than 5,000 people. And they're hungry right? They've been following him around. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I guess I don't know how that worked back then. It's like, we're just going to pick this guy and we're going to follow him around everywhere he goes. And then it's his job to feed us. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how, how that works, especially when, you know, 5,000 people are doing it. But anyway, Jesus, Jesus didn't have a problem with it. And so Jesus in, in becoming, you know, and so what Jesus realizes is that, is that there's, there's, um, thousands of people here who are hungry and they need to be fed. And so let's feed them. And so he goes in and, you know, he, he gets the, the fish and the barley 
and he breaks it up and, and not just 5,000 people, but a whole lot more than 5,000 people eat their food. And then if you keep going in, uh, in John chapter six, one of the things that Jesus says about himself, I'm scrolling down to verse 35 now, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Now, hold on a second. Jesus just fed 5,000 people. Why is what he, why, why is the statement that he is making in that passage, I am the bread of life? Well, it's really simple because in order to perform the miracle, Jesus had to become that which he already was because of the and become the physical manifestation of the bread of life so he could perform the miracle. Okay, so he, he makes this, this identity statement, I am the bread of life, and he did it after this time. Jesus is a little bit more advanced than we were. Just a little side note there for you. He's, he's a little bit farther on, along than we were than we are. And so in, in, in making that identity statement, I am the bread of life, he sets a precedent in the spirit that does two things. One, it sends the angels to bring revelation about you know, specifically what it means to be the bread of life. But two, it sets a demand. If you wake up every morning and you and and you make you know identity statements of I am a king, what that's going to do is it's going to set a demand in the spirit, and the angelic hosts that are around you will shift. That's a secret, but this, but what's going to happen is every situation and circumstance that you walk into, people are going to begin treating you like a king. And what's really awesome is what you understand, um, because you haven't gotten off into arrogance and pride, is that you are a king, right? But Jesus is the king of kings. Jesus is the king of kings. That means that you are the king that he's king of. Okay? So you begin to make the identity statement, I am a king. And as you begin to do that, the demand gets set. And then everywhere you go, people start treating you differently because of what it is that you carry. And what it is that you carry is both the anointing that's on your life as well as the angelic host that's around you. And it begins to set that demand. So let's let's look at, um, and so in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Well, why does he say, you know, so what Jesus did was in order to perform that miracle, he became the embodiment of the bread of life. You know, he always is, but in that moment, he became the embodiment of that, and that's what empowered him to perform that miracle. Let's do another example. Um, let's go to John chapter 8. So John chapter 8 is um, all about um, the person who was caught um, in adultery. Um, I find it fascinating that um, in, in its, its cultural context, but I find it fascinating that nothing was ever said about the man um, and, and why the women had to catch all the flag for it. But I guess we live in a different day. I'm thankful we do. Um, so this, this, this passage is, is fascinating to me because of this identity thing, because of this ehiye, asher ehiye. I am already everything that I will become. And so in this particular passage, it's um, so, you know, it's she was caught in adultery. Right. And then she's surrounded by all these men and they've got rocks in their hands and they're about to stone her to death. Um, <clears throat> and so Jesus, you know, he, he goes in, he goes in the situation and he kneels down and he writes something in the dirt. And everybody's got a, a whole long message about what Jesus wrote in the dirt. And nobody knows what Jesus wrote in the dirt. <laughs> it's, it's a great topical thing to preach on, but nobody knows what Jesus wrote in the dirt. If they And, and if we were supposed to know what Jesus wrote in the dirt, they would have told us, and Jesus wrote, <laughs> I'm God in the dirt. Then we would have known, but we don't know. So <clears throat> Jesus is, is, is this entire situation. Jesus is setting it up from the beginning. OK, so he goes in and he says, he who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then the Bible says that they left the oldest first in indicating that the wiser ones left first because they knew that they were not without sin. Jesus didn't leave. So without making an identity statement about himself, Jesus is making an identity statement about himself saying, I am without sin. OK, so um, in certain contexts, um, sin, so. In certain contexts, sin is considered darkness. Now, not all darkness in the in the Bible, not all darkness is evil. So in the beginning, when God created light and darkness, um, he was not creating good and evil. The light and darkness that God was creating in Genesis chapter 1 is things that have been revealed and things that have been concealed. And so darkness in, in Genesis chapter 1 is all about wisdom and understanding. And so it is, it is the glory of the Lord, you know, 
the uh, it's the glory of the Lord to conceal the matter and the glory of kings to search it out. What that's talking about is it is the glory of a king to search out matters of wisdom. And so in the, be in the beginning, the things that God um, in darkness is actually about hiddenness and being hiddenness and being revealed. So, but in this context, the, the darkness is sin. And so um, Jesus is setting this up, you know, from the beginning. So um, he goes, you know, everybody leaves, but they leave. And this is something to understand. They leave. They, they don't go home. They want to see what the, you know, this guy has thousands of people <laughs> falling around and he's just breaking bread and feeding everybody. They, they want to, you know, who is this guy? And so they're, you know, interacting with him and, and they, they go outside. They don't, they don't go away. They don't go home. They want to see what he's going to do. So Jesus looks at the woman and says, where are those who have accused you? And he said that they're all gone. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Hold on a second. Jesus is saying something else about himself. What Jesus is saying is he didn't leave. So what that means is that he that he is saying about himself that he is without sin. And in this sentence, verse uh, verse in verse 11, Jesus is saying, I have the power to condemn you because I'm without because I'm without sin, but I'm not going to. OK, and then, you know, and so and he says, go and sin no more. Verse 12, this is what I want you to pay attention to as it has to do with identity in this. And we're going to go, we're going to go through several passages and not. Jesus spoke to them again, saying, Who? The guys that just left. They didn't go anywhere. He just he just told her to go and sin no more and turned around and started addressing the guys who who hopefully dropped the rocks, but maybe still had them in their hand. He spoke to them and said, I am the light of the world. Why did he say he was the light of the world in that particular passage? The reason he said he is the light of the world in that particular passage is because in that particular passage, he is revealing sin and darkness and becoming the physical embodiment of the light of the world so that he can prove the miracle and show the glory of God in that particular situation. This is what you do when you go out and you begin and you begin to grow in identity. You walk into a situation and circumstance and, and we'll see it with Lazarus. You know, so somebody's dead. In order to, you know, and so in order to raise the dead, basically one of the things that you're becoming is the embodiment of resurrection because Jesus says, I am the resurrection. If Jesus is the resurrection, you're the resurrection, not because of anything you did, but because Jesus did it and you are one with him. And so raising the dead is actually about becoming the resurrection, becoming the physical embodiment and demonstrating Jesus on the earth because of your union and your relationship with him and that fire that exists in the back of your head. So Jesus becomes the embodiment of the light of the world. And look how he structures these, these declarations. And I, I just, I like to do it like Jesus does. He has an I am statement, and then there is an, an, an action that happens afterwards. It's always, I am fill in the blank. Therefore, this is what happens. So he says, I am the light of the world. What does the light of the world do? Well, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And, and you know, uh, and in the last chapter, he says, I am the bread of life. That's the statement. What does the bread of life do? <clears throat> the bread of life, he who follows me will never hunger and will never thirst. Okay? This is fun. Let's keep going through the Bible. I like the Bible. I'm going to take a drink of water. <clears throat> yes, I am statement with an action. All right. So John chapter 9. Here we are again. John chapter 9 is fun. All right? So uh, I'm not going to read it, but again, you have the guy who was born blind. And when you have the guy that's born blind, um, there are um, <clears throat> there is some cultural context that you probably already understand, but that you need to know. Um, and it's revealed in the discussion that happens there. The cult part of the cultural context is if you were born blind, there is a fundamental belief within that cult cultural context and construct that either you sinned or your parents sinned. Now, what that means is that you cannot be a functional part of the community, which means you're going to be very poor, which means you're going to be on the side of the road. And so that's that's what this guy did. And uh, I, I think I heard Chris Vallotton, um speaking about it one Sunday years ago. Um, and he was talking about how, you know, so <clears throat> if that had happened in your life and there was sin in your life, what would happen is people would spit on you. And, and, and so this guy's blind. He's sitting on the side of the road with a cup or a plate or a, wh however it is they begged for, you know, for money um, or for food back then. 
And all day, every day, all he would hear is, right? And then it would rain. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and, and you hear the sound, it's like, and he's going like this, right? Because the next thing that's going to happen is people are spitting on him. As long as people are walking by him, they are spitting on him because the fundamental belief is either you sinned or your father sinned. Okay, so people are walking by him and doing that all day, every day. And so he's just sitting there and I mean, can you imagine the humiliation the all, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Right. And so he's walking by and then all of a sudden Jesus comes and he's like and, and he sees the guy. Now, what's really interesting is uh, it is mean. It's really mean. I don't like it. But Jesus is really interesting in, in this uh, in this context, because what is the first thing Jesus does? I'm sorry. I probably should be making that sound on a live stream yard, but here we are. So Jesus spits in his hand, you know, so he makes the sound, right? And the guy goes like this and Jesus gets it in his hands, rubs the guy's eyes and heals it. So when Jesus heals him, he not only heals him physically, he heals him from the emotional trauma of being spit on his entire life. That's pretty good. Okay. So, and that happens, and and Jesus pulls a pulls a fast one, right? He not only does he heal the guy, he heals him on the Sabbath. Now that is bad news, right? For you know, for for Jews, right? He can't do that. And so the conversation now is, this is he's either a prophet of God or he's from Beelzebub. <laughs> and I love the dichotomy, right? Because it's it's either way far this way or way far this way. There's no middle ground when you do something on the Sabbath like that. And so, um, something to to um, look at here is even in the extreme dichotomy of what's happening, right? The, the dichotomy of um, is he from Beelzebub? Is he from God? The question remains the same: Who is Jesus? And thankfully, he answers that question in John chapter ten. So he's still talking to him, same conversation, same everything going on. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Is he from Beelzebub? Is he from God? We don't know. He did it on the Sabbath, but he healed him. He can't heal him without the power of God. You know, and so th it's this really funny conversation that's going on. And so in John chapter 10, Jesus answers. He says, I am the door of the sheep. So it, who is Jesus? Is he from God or is he not from God? And Jesus says, no, no, no. I am the doorway to God. And then, uh, so in verse seven, he says, I am the door of the sheep. And then in verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So not only, not only is he saying, you know, who's Jesus, Beelzebub or God? He says, no, 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 you guys have it wrong. I am the doorway, I'm the doorway to God, but not only am I the doorway to God, I'm the one who's going to lead you through it. And so once again, in, in this context, in the good shepherd, in, in this context, what Jesus is doing is revealing identity. Do you see how you're so much more than a son? A son sonship is amazing, and that message of sonship is amazing. It, it's awesome. But you're not just a son. You're wisdom. You're the desire of nations. You're the resurrection. You are the good shepherd. You, you're the door too. And, and again, it's not because of you. It's because of Christ. It's because of the finished work. It's because of that kind of stuff. But if you will begin framing up your life like those things, you will progress farther. You will learn more. Guys, I, I have, I'm, I, so on almost a daily basis, in the mornings, I will wake up at whatever time I wake up. Now, I tell my wife that Jesus doesn't wake up before 7 o'clock in the morning. She doesn't believe me. I told her it's true. Um, <laughs> but, but I'll make these declarations. I am a king. I am love. That's, a, that's one of my favorite ones. I am love. And almost without fail, every day, an angel will appear in front of me and start teaching me and start talking to me about love. And not only will the angel talk to me about love, the angel will want me to talk to them about love because I have a revelation. Because we, as sons, um, as love, as wisdom, have a revelation of that that they desire to look into that they don't have. And so it's a back and forth. It's not a, it's not a, a monologue. It's a dialogue. And so learning and growing about deeper things in the spirit, one of the things that I think that Western Christianity has done is we've gotten really, really good 
at going to and fro. We can go into the New Testament. We can find Revelation there. We can go back to the Old Testament and find how it connects to there. And then we go to the New Testament, and then we go to the Old Testament, and then we go to the New Testament, and then we go to the Old Testament, and we find connection points. And that is fantastic. The problem with that is that there is no depth. Is that one of the things that I encourage the people that are around me to do is don't just go to and fro. Start moving up and down. Did you know that um, in a... Um, ancient Christian perspective, the, the early, the desert fathers and, and the early Christians, one of the things that they believed um, because it was taught to them and passed down um, was that for every word, not every, um, not every scripture, but every word in the Bible, there are 70, seven zero layers of revelation that God wants to teach and show you. And so, and, and, you know, we've done, my wife and I have done long teachings on, on that different type of stuff and how to begin to dig into that. But one of the things that I fundamentally believe will help people grow in identity is to begin to mine the depths, is to begin to explore the depths. Um, and, and so what that means is sitting on a passage for a while. What that means, guys, is line upon line and precept upon precept. When it's upon, it's on top of. That's moving up and down. And so, again, I'm not saying that going the other way is wrong. I'm just saying that there is a different approach that will help with identity that I think Western, Western Christianity needs to learn. So Jesus is the good shepherd. Let's look at, um, so I'm not going to go through this one. This is Lazarus, right? Lazarus, everybody knows the story of Lazarus, John chapter 11. What's the, what's the identity statement that Jesus makes? I am the resurrection. Why does he make that identity statement? Because he just had to become the embodiment of resurrection in order to raise Lazarus from the dead. So here's one of my favorite ones. Um, that, um, And this will be the end of the, the biblical examples. Um, and then I'll talk for a little bit, um, give, tell you some fun stories, um, and then we'll wrap it up and hand it back over to Miss Ruth. Um, so this one's great. So you've got John chapter 13, right? And in John chapter 13, um, Peter is um, being Peter, I guess. And he, he says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't follow me, but you shall follow me after. And Jesus says to him, uh, Peter says, Lord, why can I follow? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus is like, ah, really? And so Jesus answered him and says, really? Most assuredly, I say to you, the roast, rooster shall not crow until you've denied me three times. Okay. So he's telling, you know, he's basically telling Peter, hey, buddy, get off of your high horse or whatever this thing is that you're doing. You need to understand that you're going to deny me three times. Now, what most people think is that that's the end of the conversation. And, and it goes the whole thing where we put the chapters and verses in there. Um, it's not the end of the conversation. And the most important part of the conversation is completely missed. In the same, so John 13 and 14, you know, it's the same conversation. Okay. So Jesus says, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. But then he says, let not your heart be troubled. Same conversation. Okay. But then <clears throat> the best part comes. And this is, the, this is the clincher for Peter. He says, hey, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. But John 14, 6 says, but I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there's the identity statement. I am the way, I'm the truth. I'm the life. What does the identity statement do? So again, like Ruth put up there, identity statement, action. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what he's saying, guys, is, hey, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. The first time you deny me, the realization of identity that you need to come into is I am the way. Jesus Christ is the way. The second time you deny me, you need to come into the realization that I am the truth. And the third time you deny me, you need to come into the realization that I am the life and that no one comes to the Father except through me. And that revelation is what took Peter from being the one who denied Christ to be the most powerful preacher in the book of Acts. The realization and revelation of identity of who Christ is, but also who Christ is in you. So Peter realized that Jesus was that, but in doing so realized that he was in him and with him and a part of him and one with him. And in that realization, it turned Peter from the weakest one to the one who converted 
a whole bunch of people in the book of Acts. That's the power of identity, guys. And and it moves beyond conversion. It moves into all kinds of things. But I truly believe that this realization and revelation of, of identity um, will cause you to shift. It will cause you to grow. It will cause you to do that. And I, I encourage you guys to begin to find things in the Bible that it says about Jesus, realizing that it's because of Jesus. It's because of Christ. It's because of his sacrifice. It's because of those things. But because of those things, and because you've been given everything that pertains to life and godliness, and because as he is, so you are, you can begin to learn about him. You can begin to grow deeper in it. And guys, this is this is about intimacy. Because the, real, the, the, the reality is, is that the more you realize who you are, the more you realize who he is and what he did. And in doing so, it's going to bring you, it's going to unlock measures of intimacy about, uh, about him that you never thought were possible, that you didn't even know existed. When you realize that you are wisdom, that, that, that you are love, that I am love, when, when that comes and becomes and rests on you, you're going to, there's going to be a dimension of the love of Christ that's going to be opened up to you that you could have never imagined before. This is one of the biggest, you know, so one of the biggest secrets in growing in intimacy and love with Jesus is the realization of who you are because of what he did. It's a massive thing. And it's massive for growing in new areas. You know, I, I find a lot of people, and this is one of my biggest, biggest frustrations with the prophetic movement, is that really nothing new has come into the prophetic movement for about the past 30 years. There hasn't been really any new revelation. There hasn't really been, there's been lots and lots and lots of strategy. And the strategy is fascinating. The strategy is amazing. The strategy is good. The strategy is, it is great. But strategy is about stuff that we already know. And the reason I believe that people have not ventured outside of what has already been known, at least to us, is because we haven't realized who we are. And the more you realize who you are, the more new dimensions or new revel new realms of revelation around different things, around creation, around, around all kinds of things that begin to open up to you because all of a sudden you begin to open up to it. And as you open up to it, God is re there waiting and ready to reveal the revelation of intimacy that's going to open up a whole new part of your life in God. And it's massively important for all of us. And all you have to do is figure out who Jesus is. And as you figure out who Jesus is, you come into the realization of Ehie Asher Ehie. I am already everything that I will become. I already have everything that pertains to life and godliness. That revelation will open up things in your life that you could have never possibly imagined. And look, it may be miracles. It may be signs. It may be wonders. It may be understanding. It may be the capacity to help somebody that you couldn't previously relate to. All of those things are important. So I wanted to start today and hand you guys that little nugget, not realizing what Ruth wanted to do. So um, thank you, Ruth, for having me. Let me talk for 45 minutes. I appreciate it. Woo, that was all super yummy. <laughs> so super yummy and so super, super powerful. You know, um, I have just one question, though. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we it's it's very actually easy to say, you know, so, you know, it, it's what we believe who Jesus is. And so, of course, that's who we are. Right. That's what you say. Right. And that is what the Bible say. And we know that. But there are just times or some people that have a hard time believing that, you know, oh, mm -hmm. Jesus can do that because he's God. But I can't do that because I'm not, you know that type of skepticism, that kind of negativity. How are you able to actually speak to the people just to go and encourage them, not even like convince them, right? Just, you know, like simple uh, encouragement that say that would trigger them actually that that's that's not true. How are you going to approach somebody like that? Sure. So so the first thing that I would um, that I would tell those people is that um, is that the most powerful tool that God has given you is your free will. Mm -hmm. And so in your, and, and so the reality of who you are as a son, as somebody who loves Jesus has absolutely nothing to do with how you feel. You may feel unworthy. You may feel 
however it is that you feel. But in your free will, if you will decide that that no matter how you feel, this is what you're going to believe, yeah. then your emotions and everything else will line up around it. There was a point in time in my life where I really didn't like asparagus. I, I just I, I couldn't stand it. I didn't like the taste. And then one day I said, I like asparagus. Today I like asparagus and I ate asparagus every day for the next three days. And now I love asparagus and it's actually just a free will decision of no matter how you feel, how you feel isn't the reality that's going on in the spirit. You know, I have actually, um, sorry, I have actually, I learned it the hard way it, or I have been so deceived before that it's, I've always depended on what I feel, but what you feel and even the reality right? It's actually doesn't have to be the truth. The mm -hmm. truth is what God says. It's not how you feel. It's not what you think. And I love what you say. You have to decide. It is a decision. Mm -hmm. It's always a decision because he is a good father. Yes, he is. He doesn't just want you to be uh, you know, a robot or something. You have to go on this. I give it to you. It's And it's for free. But if you don't want it, I can't help it, right? I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Wow. Thank you so much. I love that. You know, just being reminded we are one with Christ. Whoever is Christ, that's who you are on earth. And I love that, you know, that intimacy is what brings it out. And I love that it's how much you know about God is how much power you get through it. <laughs> Whoa, your identity is knowing Jesus, guys. That's that's about it, right, um, Joseph? I love that when, okay, I, I'm going to go on the side here. I'm Dude. not, not going to go on whatever you, this that you said. I love that you said every day I see him every day face to face. You know, I, I you know, Jesus, Jesus visited you in the beginning, but now you just go and see him every day. Can you just go and expound on that just for people that are, you know, not believing in mystics? <laughs> sure. Um, so, you know, the biggest the biggest thing for me was actually John 14, um, where Jesus says, if you love me and keep my commandments, I will manifest myself to you. And the only way that you can know love is by realizing how much he loved you first. But the more you come into the realization of how much he loved you first, the more you will actually be able to love. Yeah. And that is something that is not just for special people. Yeah. Like um, it is something that I believe is, is for everybody. And so, yeah. you know, different days, um, different days, there's different measures of clarity. Sometimes you yeah. see it really clear. Yeah. And something I love is that he doesn't always appear in, in the same way. Yeah. Um, um, and so in, in, in doing that, it's, it's always fresh. It's always, um, you know, that kind of stuff, but it's always, um, it's not always as clear too. And so mm -hmm. how clear it is, is actually due to your focus. Right. Um, and so that's why focus is so important. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's important not to put God in a box mm. and use every type of imagination and creativity. And it's all his anyway, at the end of the day, right? Uh, Joseph, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like being a child. Whoa, that's amazing. Wow. Mm. I mean, <laughs> you give yeah. him up and oh, that's a nice pen, you know, anything. Mm. It's just the wonder. It's just yeah. the wonder. That That's something that I think uh, all of us should never lose. The wonder of who God is in everything, in every mm -hmm. single thing. Um, there's a, okay. Um, Ira from the Philippines is asking when Jesus says he is the door to God, or I am the shepherd that takes care of his sheep. Does that mean he's the same as God, he is God. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, go the, the Godhead has three per, three persons: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Mm -hmm. So yes, Jesus is God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if there, wow. Um, I need if you don't mind just imparting to people because guys, if you want to know more about uh, Brother Joseph, you have to go to YouTube, our YouTube channel, Beautiful Powerful Women. We have an interview um, uh, of my brother there of his past. So if you see him now happy and all these things, I mean, you have to go and listen to, um, you know, our interview with him before so that you will understand how powerful the love of God is. Mm. right i mean he he i could see him dancing and and being happy and he says i've decided to be happy no matter what happens wow i mean there's just so many things that um you can you can actually find out about who you are in christ so that that's actually going to pull out the real you 
That's true. Right? The real, the real, I, I, I love it that when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you're completely different. We're, we're a different person. We are now in the rightful place of who we are. So when we sin again, that's not your nature anymore. Your nature is Jesus. <laughs> Gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Anyway, okay, guys, there's more. Okay, tomorrow we're going to be talking about crazy stuff like, you know, things that are not of earth. And that's something that I, I love that you're just so bold in writing about. That's why I, I that's why I put in here the um, his books, guys, because honestly, these books are gonna open your imaginations. These books are gonna open your 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 thinking because most of the time we are just so skeptical. What we see is what we get and all that. But mm -hmm. that's not the adventure and the joy that God wants to give us, right? Yeah. Can you give a little bit of that before tomorrow? Sure. Um, and so I, I believe that um, that all of us um, in, in, in one way or another um, have capacity to have a, a, a relationship with God that is beyond our wildest imagination. Yeah. Um, and and not only do I, I believe that I'm I'm committed to helping people in that direction um, mm -hmm. because I truly believe it is um, it is a gift that all of us um, can partake of. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, ever since I was 16, I started playing the piano and I just go in a different realm, different dimensions. You know, I had and, and I really thought that I was crazy, but it was too good to be crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't really mind. So he, he has such an amazing way of explaining to us all these things. So I hope to see you guys tomorrow at the same time here. OK. But I want to give you an opportunity. Do you, if you have been blessed by what we have done today, I, I put in here, um, here, there. You can always sow uh, into his life, into his ministry, into whatever he is doing, because I always believe in that, you know. Whatever it is that you sow, it grows, guys. So it's an investment to go and bless this man of God and his faithful. Okay, at the same time, I'm going to go and see you guys tomorrow. If you don't mind... Um, praying for us um so you know what before that if you have any questions as to what we have done uh, what, what he has discussed today you know put it put it aside tomorrow we will have a little bit more discussion today yeah. I, i'm gonna go and let him go um it's been an hour that was quick it was so quick beautiful. yeah but you know what um guys you you um you share uh, to your friends. Tell them that uh, Joseph is going to be with us tomorrow. He's going to yep. be talking about great and mighty things, great clouds of witnesses. I can't. I I've I've just, I've heard his interviews before. I know I know his heart, but it doesn't go old. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it, it it never does. And I and I love the conversational aspect. I love the the dual screen. Let's have a let's have a chat and see where it goes. Yes, that's fun. Okay, okay, guys. Um, my dear brother, why don't you go and close us in prayer, and sure. then uh, we'll we'll see you tomorrow. How's awesome. that? Yeah, sounds great. Father, we love you. Thank you Ooh. so much for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Mm. Jesus, thank you that where two or more are gathered, you are in our midst. Yes. And so, Father, um, Holy Spirit, we welcome you um, into these meetings together, and I release you towards the people who are. Yes. Um, release your presence towards the people who are here, towards the families, towards their lives. Yes. Um, and I release the angelic host to go and work with them and work around them. So, Father, we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Guys, you don't need to go and strive to please the Lord. He is pleased with you. <laughs> it's not what we've done. It's what he has done on the cross. It's done. It's done. So we bless you guys and we thank you again and see you guys tomorrow at the same time. Okay. In Jesus name, we bless you. Bye. Bye.